back to another special edition of the Michael Deacon program. Yes, you guessed it. My name is Michael and I am your host. Pleased to meet you. Joining us tonight is in fact Captain Dan Handley. Mr. Handley was terminated by United Airlines in 2003 for speaking out on issues surrounding 9-11. Can you believe that? A former 35-year veteran pilot, he has flown extensively in U.S. Naval and Commercial Aviation Boys and Girls. He's got skin in the game, no doubt. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing us into your hearts and into your minds. Here we are again on a night like this. Greetings, boys and girls. The wait is over. I've been resurrected once more, and I appreciate you all out there for being here. This one will be one to keep. Captain Dan Hanley is one of the most interesting individuals I've had a chance to speak to, and I'm quite sure you'll enjoy his time with us all this evening. Now let's bring in my uh, co-host, 
Mr. Mike Hideous. What's going on, Mike? How are you, my friend? Hello, Mr. Deacon, and uh, a good Friday evening to you, my friend. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much for being here. The one and only Mike Hideous, ladies and gentlemen, of course, he has drawn assignment yet again this evening, and I thank him for it. Mike, this is going to be fascinating. I hope you enjoy the red pill that's coming. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. <laughs> now let's bring in the guest, Captain Dan Hanley, who I believe is patiently waiting. Now, Mike, if only I could unmute him here, we could bring him in. Or maybe he <laughs> muted himself here again. <laughs> uh, Dan, uh, uh, Captain Dan, are, are you there, Captain? Yes, I am, uh, Michael. Good evening. Thank you so much. I'm glad you muted yourself there. That's very professional of you. You've done this before, Dan. A few times, yes. <laughs> very nice. I, as a matter of fact, I had my own uh, radio program for a while. Yes, so. you did. Yes, you did. And I was going to ask you about that as we jump into things here tonight. And I do want to welcome you tremendously. It's an honor and pleasure to have you here to talk to us about all these things surrounding 9-11, another anniversary just around the horizon, my friend. Yes, indeed. And uh, thank you for having uh, me on the program, Michael. I appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to have the opportunity to uh, present a lot of information that we have on our uh, website that we'll talk about tonight. No doubt, no doubt. And of course, as a preamble, I want you to walk us through your background. And I really want you to get into detail. And also, I want you to tell us your recollection of the morning of 9-11, such as where you were, what your initial thoughts were. I've got more to add to that, but I digress. Okay. Well, I commenced flying over uh, 50 years ago in 1968. Uh, first as a civilian, I got my... Uh, private commercial instrument and model the engine rating by 1970. And I want to add that the planes I flew, the light Cessnas were the same aircraft that the uh, hijackers flew in. But uh, I went on to Southern Illinois University uh, for three years where I got a Bachelor of Science in Applied Math. And uh, when I got out, Vietnam was still raging and I was going to get drafted, but I had my flight experience, so I chose to go into uh, naval aviation. Uh, and I flew the uh, P-3 Orion aircraft, which is a four-engine turboprop that we used to track Soviet submarines during the Cold War. I'm showing my age. But anyhow, <laughs> um, in 1978, I was hired as a pilot at United Airlines. And over the next 25 years, I flew about a six or seven different aircraft. And uh, in uh, 2003, I was wrongfully uh, retired early, 11 years prior to my mandatory retirement age of uh, 65 for speaking out about safety, security, and other 9-11 uh, related issues. So over a career span of 35 years, I flew 15 uh, different type of aircraft, accumulating over uh, 20,000 flight hours. Right. Now, as a result of being outspoken about 9-11, you were terminated, as you said, but I'm curious yeah. what, what, what it was, what exactly was it, Dan, that really drove it home, that landed you on the proverbial radar, Captain? Okay. Well, um, it was a while. This was 2002, 2003 time frame I'm talking about now. Right. And it was a a little while after 9-11 that they came out and talked about the experience level or inexperience level of uh, these alleged hijackers. And I, I couldn't believe it was possible that they only trained in uh, light Cessna aircraft and flew the 757 and 767. But I wasn't reporting that. There were uh, huge gaping holes in the aviation security system. And uh, I was up against uh, flight crews and passengers who were scared to death after 9-11. And there was a bunch of promises made uh, to air crew about security measures they were going to take, but were never implemented, such as cameras in the back of the aircraft, secondary barrier protection, uh, federal air marshals on board. I flew uh, for two years after 9-11, mainly New York to London, and I didn't have a single air marshal on. And, Flight attendants and pilots were telling me, say something, you got to say something. So 
I did speak out. I see. Uh, initially, just with my uh, chief pilot, my union leader that were friends of mine in New York. And then I started uh, sending in reports to the company. And uh, they were internal reports. Uh, I didn't want uh, the information I had to get out into the, the public. So uh, I was getting so mauled. As a matter of fact, I was getting backlash for submitting them. Uh, my union boss called me one night and said, watch it, Dan, these guys are nasty. If you take it to the next level, you're going to get hurt. And I said, who are these guys? And he says, I can't tell you. And then I sent a letter into the uh, vice president of safety for United Airlines, and he called my chief pilot and said to him on the phone, is Hanley one of yours? And he said, yes. He says, well, you tell that expletive deleted effective Sunday mor uh, Monday morning if he thinks he can do a better job than me then he's the new uh, vice president of safety. And I went, I was taken back on what kind of a response is that? So I'll shorten it up because I've done programs that I just discussed my grounding. But uh, long story short, uh, this went on for two years and they finally, uh, I decided to implicate the FAA uh, by sending in a report that was outside the company. And the day I did it, they uh, pulled me off the line for no reason that I had to come up to uh, uh, New York to talk with uh, Chief Pilot. Well, the union already told me they weren't going to represent me if I carried it in this far. And uh, so I, I insisted that I have a lawyer present because uh, this was extraordinary what they did to me, although I'd seen them do it to other pilots in the past, and they, de they declined. So we were at an impasse. I was still on... Uh, the pay, payroll, uh, and uh, a while later, uh, my chief pilot was out in Denver at our training center, and he ran into the uh, uh, chief flight surgeon for United Airlines, and he said, put that expletive deleted on sick list. So um, my chief pilot calls me and apologizes and said, I'm sorry, Dan, my hands are tied on this. This is coming from up on top. And I said, well, this is punitive now. I haven't done anything wrong, but submitted federally mandated safety and security reports to the airline that implicate the FAA. You're violating uh, federal aviation regulations. And he, he apologized because I know, I know, but my hands are tied. So uh, long story short, uh, we were at an impasse. And uh, Finally, I call, I was going to run out of sick list, which meant I was going to go non-pay, which I thought was punitive. Right. So I called my chief pilot and said, uh, what are my options? Well, let me digress for a minute and back up about six months. Go ahead. My uh, union lawyer and the grievance committee chairman at, uh, at the union told me that uh, if I continued to do what I was going to do, the airline would find some way of grounding me professionally, medically, psychologically, or otherwise, but that I'd never fly another United Airlines airplane again in my life, which is what wound up happening. Uh, so anyhow, he told me the only way I could uh, keep my paycheck coming in was to agree, I, oh, I, let me back up to what I was doing. Because they told me that, and because I'd never flunked a check ride in my life in 35 years, I'd never flunked a medical or a physical in the 35 years I flew right. uh, or a psychological screening. So I had seen in the past at United and other airlines where they use the uh, psychological grounding to uh, get rid of pilots. So to protect myself, I went down, I lived in Atlanta at the time and I went to the uh, best uh psychiatrists and psychologists I could find. And I said, look, here's where I am at United. Here's what I think they're going to try to do to me. Run every test you can on me. I'll even visit you for counseling, which I did. I said, just to prove that I'm mentally stable because they're going to try to throw me out the door. So jump back where I was. Um, when I, they told me I had to fly up to Chicago. They flew me up first class and said I had to go over and visit the uh, company uh, aeromedical physician there. Uh, now, they also told me that to keep my pay coming in, that this program was endorsed by the company, the FAA, and my union, that I had to do whatever they asked me to do. So um, 
reluctantly I agreed to do this. And when I met with the flight surgeon, the first question he asked me was, would you be willing to see our mental health professionals? And I said, well, I knew you were gonna ask me that. So I said, well, I gotta go along with the program here. So I said, yes, of course. So I'll, I'll stop it by saying that when I met with the, uh, the psychiatrist, he came up with the bogus diagnosis and I'll get into another gent named Hill McConnell that they tried to do the same thing to, uh, and they grounded me for life. So uh, afterwards, I filed a federal aviation uh, reg uh, whistleblower protection report, and they lost the first one. So I filed another one, and I had a huge packet of information that included a correspondence trail, uh, my medical records, et cetera and sent that in certified mail to the FAA in Washington. And they, I call, waited a few weeks and called them and they said, uh, well, this is gonna take six months to a year. Well, that was unsatisfactory for me. So I wound up writing the uh, Department of Transportation, the uh, Department of Homeland Security because it involved uh, security issues and the Department of Justice because they had violated uh, RICO laws and doing what they did to me. So the Department of Justice ignored me. The Homeland Security sent me back to the FAA, and the FAA stonewalled me for a few years. So uh, I'll tell you how it wound up, and I'll wrap this up. I uh, fought with the Department of Transportation for a period of five years on this, and another matter I was trying to get uh, be, uh, as a whistleblower, but I won't go into that right now. Uh, and I got it all the way up to the Department of Transportation Inspector General, and they wound up closing my case without interviewing a single witness or reviewing any of the evidence I had. So I was going to file a federal lawsuit, a federal tort claim against the government on this, but I couldn't find an attorney. So I wrote up my own... Uh, suit and was going to represent myself pro se and I sent an advanced copy to the attorney general and the attorney general forwarded it back to the FAA oh, wow. and a few weeks later I get a, a letter from the head lawyer at the FAA saying that I'd be he'd be in my point of contact there so he had a phone number on the letter and I called him and uh, we had a heated discussion him more heated than I on the phone and uh at the end of the conversation he laughed at me and said go ahead and file it you'll lose and slam the phone down on me so that's how my career ended my goodness and of course you yeah. said you never filled a physical examination or the psych test which a lot of right. americans out there can't even pass uh today <laughs> to be honest with you uh, you know it's it's quite yeah. difficult for some individuals out there you'd be surprised yeah, yeah. Well, this this practice of grounding pi uh, pilots on those grounds uh, is called a nuclear device amongst pilots because if they can't get you professionally, medically, or otherwise, they use this process. And I saw it happen uh, with other pilots at United, which is why I uh, protected myself. But that did no good given what happened in the aftermath. So. Right, right. And as a result, this really turned your world upside down, uh, per yes, se, yes. correct? What, what was going on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what was going on during this time in your personal life, uh, Captain, if you don't mind uh, speaking oh, about that? I don't that. mind at all. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I worked, the, over the last 15 years, I've worked with a lot of whistleblowers, and my story is the same as theirs. Uh, right. Destroys families. Right. Uh, destroys you financially, destroys you, uh, your, uh, your reputation, your career, you lose money on the deal. So, um, uh, for me personally, uh, it was horrible. Uh, my wife at the time couldn't understand why I was sticking my neck out the way I was. And we had, uh, we even went to, uh, uh, counseling to try to resolve our differences. But, uh, after, my uh, two kids were too young to understand any of it and uh, and what was going on with me. And uh, so after, after two years, 
uh, she stuck with me. And then uh, I got involved in another high profile whistleblowing uh, case that involved the mafia. And uh, she became alarmed. The mafia? That, that's a story for another whole program. Oh, my but goodness. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get you back alarmed. on for that one. Yeah, that's, that's for part two. <laughs> my goodness. She, uh, we separated. And uh, ultimately, sorry. we wound up getting a divorce. Well, my two children blame me for the divorce. Right, Still right, believe right. the official 9-11 story and that their dad, some kind of a whacked out conspiracy freak yep. and they don't talk to me today and financially well it ruined my reputation and my career and financially i figured one time that i lost about four million dollars in pay pension and stock so wow. yeah yeah you lost yeah. a lot there and i'm sorry about uh, your children there i i've noticed yeah. that sort of pattern as well with a lot of uh, whistleblowers like you mentioned uh, it, it really has an impact on the family life, no doubt. And your kids go on and anytime they hear 9-11, they think about their father and that drives them just off the wall, uh, Dan. And I, I've heard this so many times and it, it it's definitely uh, heartbreaking to say the least. Yeah. Right. Right. It. That yeah, was my most painful loss. I, I hear you. Four million in the career was one thing, uh, but... Yeah, that still hurts. But your, but your kids, you know, that's that's a different story, and and yeah, you have my sympathies on that. Oh, thank you, Mike. No doubt, no doubt. And anyhow, uh, if we could start in uh, on some of the material on. Uh, yes, but hold on uh, before we do. Before we do, um, in the intro, okay. I, I was asking you about the whole morning of 9-11 and your recollection oh, yeah, of the yeah, events. Yeah, Let, yeah let's sorry. yeah, let's start there before we go anywhere, before we forget, because I definitely want to know your initial reactions and just all the conversations you were having that day with fellow employees. Right. Jump in there. Well, uh, I got into Newark Airport from the West Coast the night before and there were thunderstorms. I almost had to divert. That's why it was so clear that day. A cold front had passed through. So uh, I lived in Atlanta with a commuter to New York and I checked in at the uh, Newark Hilton and asked for a late. I was going to go to London the next night and I asked for uh, a late check on the agreed. So I went up to my room and I was actually supposed to meet my uh, wife, who was a flight attendant with United also in London that night. And uh, I went to bed and about eight, well, right when the airplanes were hitting, I didn't know what, uh, housekeeping start beating on my door very hard, screaming housekeeping. And I had a do not disturb sign on the door. <laughs> and I thought, uh, what? And I said, I'm sleeping. And I thought, what the heck are they doing? Well, I heard it down the hall going on too. So I fell back asleep and wound up sleeping through the whole uh, the whole ordeal. Oh, and I my. woke up I woke up about eleven and uh, I got on my cell phone and I had like twenty calls and the first one uh, was from my wife saying it's horrible, it's horrible, call me. Well the first thing I thought was something happened, my kids were in an accident or something right. horrible like that. And then I got a call from a neighbor that said, uh, Dan, we hope you're all right. Uh, we're just checking on you because they knew I was in New York or Newark. <clears throat> Anyhow, I went over. I couldn't get an outside line on my cell phone, so I went over to the uh, room phone and tried to call out, and I couldn't get an outside line there. Well, finally, I was able to get out on my cell phone, and I talked to my wife, and she said to me, uh, she was crying, said, it's so terrible, it's so terrible. I go, what happened? Is it, is it the kids? And she goes, what are you talking about? I go, did something happen to the kids? And she goes, you don't know. I said, no, what? And she goes, two airplanes hit the World Trade Center and they've collapsed. Another one crashed out in Pennsylvania and another one hit the Pentagon. You've got to get out of there. We're under attack. So, I mean, the blood almost chilled in my veins. I was like uh, taken back and I ran over to the window and threw open the curtains and uh, I was, all I could see was the north end of Manhattan, but the turnpike was a parking lot and there was smoke over the north part of the uh, the, uh, the city. So I, I said, I see it, I see it. Uh, I said, I'll call down to the desk and see if I can keep the room. She goes, well, all the flights are canceled. So 
Uh, am I going into too much detail, no, no, Michael? No. Or no, you're good. Yeah. You're you're good. This is fantastic. I I wanted all the details about what happened that Super Tuesday, as I refer to it as. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I called down to the desk, and they said we've already sold your room. You got to get out as soon as possible. And uh, so I I was in shaving and had the TV on, and I hear Rudy Giuliani talking about the jumpers. Uh, and I was imagining how horrible that was. Wow. Uh, anyhow, I got in my uniform and went down the lobby and it was jam packed with people around the uh, TV in the bar. And when they saw a United uniform, I got swarmed by reporters and I said, look, I don't know anything more than you do. I'm trying to get over to the airport because years ago when TWA 800 blew up out over Long Island Sound, a flight attendant friend of ours ran to the departure airport because that's where the next to kin go when there's been an accident. So I thought the plane United 93 had taken off out of Newark. I'll go over there and see if I can help out in any way. So I went to the front desk and they go, you're not going to get in there. I said, well, are the vans running? They go, yes. I said, well, I'm going to try. So I went out front and uh, a van just pulled up and I hopped in the driver. I said, can you get me over there? And she goes, huh, honey, you're not going to get near that place. I go, we'll try anyhow. So uh, we drove over there with the parking lot trying to get over there. And they had snow equipment back uh, blocking the exit ramp. So unbelievably, I showed my ID. There were soldiers there. So I'm a United pilot. I'm trying to get in to help. And they waved me through. So I got down to uh, Newark Flight Operations. The airport was a ghost town. There wasn't anybody around. And uh, I got down there and actually was with pilots that had taxied out and seen the airplanes hit the towers. Uh, and uh, so they told me the FBI wanted to talk to them about exactly what what they saw that day. So we spent the whole day sitting down in flight operations and uh, them recounting what they had seen. And one crew had actually brought in the night before Jason Dahl, the captain that uh, flew uh, United Flight 93 that crashed out in Pennsylvania, they brought him in. He sat up in the cockpit. They talked to him all evening and had actually taken him up the gate to say goodbye. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was like everybody else, I was pretty much in shock and I thought we were under attack uh, by someone, sure. anyhow. Yeah, for sure. sure. And, uh, yeah, definitely. So, uh, about six o'clock in the evening, I'll shorten this up. Uh, the FBI said they didn't need to talk to the pilots anymore, and they were gonna we were gonna have to double up in hotel rooms, but spend the night there. And I said, no, I'm not going to. I'm gonna try to get get uh, to Atlanta. And they said to me, uh, good luck with that. So yeah, you'd have to I wound walk. up going down to Newark, and uh, I caught an all night train back to Atlanta. So that was my 9-11 day. I had no and idea I mean, about the wife, by the way. I didn't know she was a flight attendant. Yes. The yes. ex-wife, I should say. Yes. My goodness. Oh. Yeah, a terrible situation. And uh, before we turn it back to you, uh, Captain, I just wanted to ask Mike really quickly uh, about his recollection of the morning of 9-11. Uh, Mike, do you recall where you were? Oh, yeah. Do you really? Um, I, I, Go ahead. Uh, at the time, as you may recall, I, I was a musician, so I was spending very late nights up at night, um, you know, with a lot of crazy people and you sure. know, partying all night. So I had slept. I was sleeping very late, and uh, basically I got a phone call um, after the planes had hit. So I'm not exactly sure what time that was, but I was laying in bed, and my answering machine went off. I heard my I heard my mother crying and calling my name, Michael, Michael, Michael. And I literally I jumped out of bed because I didn't know what was going on. I jumped out of bed. I must have knocked everything over, just slip in, fall in, trying to get the phone. And I picked up the phone and I'm like, what's the matter? What's the matter? She thought. She thought I was in New York City because mm. often I mean, I lived right in in Kearney near the Holland Tunnel. So um, she thought I was in New York City. I wasn't. I was in I was in Jersey that night uh, and day. And um, so she told me now, mind you, the building that I lived in, uh, I was on the second floor where I lived. 
and it had a third floor where I knew uh, the artist who lived up there. And um, we used to be able to see the New York City skyline from our building. In fact, you could even see it from our street. So uh, when my mother called me, she's like, turn on the television. So she turned on television and I, I see what's going on and I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm stunned. Now, mind you, on the television, all I could see was the smoke and one tower had already collapsed. I didn't see that, but all I saw was the smoke and one tower. And while I was on the phone, the second one collapsed and that's when it hit me. I realized that both of them were gone and I was absolutely traumatized at that point. I ran outside uh, into the street and I could see where all the smoke was and it was just absolutely devastating. Uh, I'll tell you, after seeing it all, you know, the anger that, that ensued within me about, you know, someone's got to pay for this. Um, it didn't hit me until that night. Uh, I think it was when, uh, did, did the president speak that night? President Bush, did he, did he speak that night or was it the following night? I don't believe so. Don't, yeah. It was the following night, right? I believe he might have the following night. Yes. Well, all I know is that that, that evening after it happened, uh, I was watching the news and, um, I, I, I broke down because I was so shocked at what had happened and I, I just couldn't, it, it just hit me all at once. It's very and surreal. It yeah. Yeah. It hit me like 12 hours later. Sure. It's a very emotional uh, time in our nation's history, whether, uh, nefarious or not. Yeah. The end result is still the same. To this day, I'm, to, to be perfectly honest with you, it's one of the reasons I left <clears throat> Kearney, New Jersey, because um, I, uh, there were some tense moments during the, uh, the Obama administration uh, where I sincerely believed that there was going to be a terrorist attack in New York. It's, I had to get away. And I left New Jersey for that one of the, that was one of the main reasons I left New Jersey. I, I was I, I was really affected by it because I, I could see it from my building. I could see it from my my street. And it was devastating. I mean, I didn't actually I wasn't as close to some of the people in Jersey City. Sure. Or or uh, maybe Newark or, or, or close to, you know, close to the river. But, you know, I'm about where I was living. I was about 10 minutes from from where uh, the river was that separates New York and New Jersey. And I, I was I was traumatized for for years after that. I really was bothered. Understood. And of course, we are still paying for that today. No doubt in the chat room. I saw that comment. You're right. The war has not ended this holy war. Many people in the media do not like to tell you that little fact, but, oh, it is. It's always been a holy war, boys and girls, and that's why there's no end to the conflict in the East. Unfortunately, I feel terrible for that, but I don't see these wars ever ending anytime soon. Not until Christ himself comes down to the sky and puts an end to that. Uh, but, Mike, uh, you and I both agree we know what, what's going on there. Well... Uh, you know, that's I'm not, not going to happen. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna take the show up here. I, 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 Definitely. I would really like to hear uh, Captain Hanley's uh, views more uh, instead of Definitely. my opinion. Yes. Uh, by the way, I'm still excited that you're here, Captain. I have not spoken to many pilots in regards to 9-11. Uh, and of course, There's we will... There's only a few of us out there, uh, right. Michael. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So, you know, we're going to get into the fact that it was so uh, difficult to maneuver these planes and the way they were flown, allegedly flown. We'll, we'll get into detail about that in a moment here. And uh, my goodness, Dan, once again, I, I do want to thank you for being here with us and uh, being so honest and open. Well, I try to be honest and what I'm going to say tonight are facts. Uh, I try not to speculate on 9-11. Uh, I've worked with uh, some people that are walking, talking encyclopedias of knowledge about it, and uh, 
it's an event that occurred 20 years ago, but it's amazing how many people are working behind the scenes trying to bring uh, things to public life, which I can get on get on about in a little bit here. Uh, but uh, you talked about the maneuvers. Uh, well, can I start in and just mention uh, yeah, the website ahead. we have for our organization, uh, Michael, and uh, go from there because a lot of what we're going to talk about is on there. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I told you my flight experience experiment experience. Uh, I uh, currently serve as director and international public uh, spokesperson for a global grassroots organization called 911 Pilots Whistleblowers, and we have a website at 911pilots.org, uh, and that's what I'd like to cover as the material on there because. There's an About Dan Hanley page, and uh, the first few paragraphs is what I just talked about my experience. But I make a statement on there that with all my flight experience, I can unequivocally state that I could not possibly have flown the 911 flight profiles, in particular the Pentagon profile, which we can talk about, at those speeds and altitudes and flying the spectacular aerial maneuvers performed by the alleged hijackers, which we can also talk about. But I want to mention, We've got a lot of information through the Freedom of Information Act from the NTSB and ATC uh, radar data. And the speeds we'll talk about that these aircraft were flying at, uh, clocked on radar, exceeds the uh, maximum operating speed of a 757 and 767 by about 120 to 140 miles an hour. And we have uh, engineers uh, looking at how this could possibly be that uh, those aircraft were flying uh, that that fast. But uh, in essence, when you uh, get on our website, there's five slides that uh, at the top of the page, and uh, it welcomes you to 911pilots.org, demanding the truth about 9-11 uh, and justice for the world. And then we ask the question, could, uh, Poorly trained pilots do this, and it shows United 175 smashing into the South Tower. And then we answer by saying highly experienced pilots couldn't. And that's what we're doing at 911pilots.org. Right. Uh, I can talk about that later. But uh, we assert that there were no Muslim hijackers at the controls of the 911 aircraft and that they were remotely controlled through a system called the uninterruptible autopilot that essentially takes remote control and electronically hijacks the aircraft and prevents the pilots from disconnecting this system. And the system allows uh, re the remote controller to fly it to wherever it wants. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself talking about that, so I'll, I'll stop there. And for listeners, uh, before you turn off the program, allow me the chance to explain a few things about the system later on. But uh, it, we don't believe that the, uh, these 19 alleged Muslim hijackers could have possibly been in control of the aircraft that day because they'd never flown the very complex and highly sophisticated uh, uh, 757767 aircraft, nor had they ever flown a jet in their lives. So it's my assertion, as well as others, that the vast uh, majority of the over 290,000 pilots in the world will agree with our contention once they get on the website and read the material we have. So we intend to seek them out, and I'll tell you about how, how we're going to do that. Uh, if you go to the home page of the website, uh, I introduce myself, and uh, what we're doing, uh, we've got a great communication system set up, an emailing system, and we're getting email addresses from pilots around the world, and we're asking them, if they'd be willing to examine available evidence, such as we have on the website, and testify before a committee on camera via Skype or some other medium, or in person, as to the difficulty of these uh, maneuvers supposedly executed by these hijackers on 9-11, such that even a highly trained pilot could testify and could not have flown the profiles on that day. So we're looking for experienced pilot's input in identifying the skills and aptitudes which a pilot has to master distinguishing them from persons who lack such training. So what we do is once we contact the pilot, we send them an affidavit and it's a simple uh, PDF filler format and they just type it in 
on their computer or download it and email it back to us and we're compiling all this data and i'll talk about what we're going to do about it in a minute but if i could as an example just give uh the purported uh pro flight profile flown by alleged muslim hijacker hani hanjur and i keep saying alleged who supposedly piloted american flight 77 that struck the pentagon the aircraft was reported to have conducted a Descending, accelerating 330 degree corkscrew turn from 7,000 feet just west of the Pentagon. And this guy arrived precisely at ground level to strike the Office of Naval Intelligence at nearly 500 miles per hour. Now, assessment of the max speed is probably about 120 miles per hour. So this guy was doing 500 miles per hour. And this is important. And there's uh, I want to point out to any of the listeners that if they go to our website, 911pilots.org, we've got a number of videos on there that support what we're saying here because this maneuver was uh, replicated in a simulator and uh, highly experienced pilots got in and they tried to perform the maneuver on successive attempts without crashing. Well, they did. And Hani Hanjur accomplished this on his first attempt with minimal flight experience in Cessna aircraft, having only a few hundred hours of total flight time. Now, we got a short video on here. Uh, a guy I know, uh, there's an organization called Pilots for 9-11 Truth, and he's interviewed by former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura about the lack of experience that Hani Hanjur had. And then later in the video, it shows my friend Rusty Amer, who has about 45,000 hours and about 20 different airplanes, and with a, a young pilot, and he tries repeatedly to perform this maneuver, and every time he attempted it, he crashed. And at the end of the video, Rusty looks at him and says, you couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it either. And that's what we're getting on these affidavits. Pilots saying not only could the, the uh, hijackers not do those maneuvers, but they couldn't fly them themselves. So uh, we're, there's another group that we're working with here. It's an international grassroots group, and I'd like to go into it a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. Because uh, we're uh, dovetailing in right behind them with what they're doing. It's called the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. Uh, a group of lawyers in the United States got together with the biggest 9-11 whistleblowers in the world and uh, they collected evidence and uh, testimony from them. And uh, what they did was petition the New York District Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Jeffrey Berman, uh, to convene a grand jury. Now, let me just tell you about some of the whistleblowers here. I'm, go I'm gonna wind up sidetracking if you don't mind uh, uh, talking about them, but it is relevant to 9-11. Uh, Richard Gage, is a 20-year architect from San Francisco. He founded this group called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And it's comprised of, excuse me, 3,000 architects and engineers from around the world who are demanding an investigation into the collapse of buildings one, two, and seven. And yes, there was a third building that collapsed that day because they're claiming it was structurally impossible for this to happen. And I might mention that Never in the history of high-rise steel frame office fire building has, has they have they ever collapsed, and on 9/11, all three of them did. Yeah, it's very interesting. So, Never in history uh, structural engineering steel frame high-rise building has ever gone down in flames. Right. And yes, three went down in one day. And I always ask, right. how is that even uh, possible? My goodness. And you look at the way they came down, that was uh, concrete and steel, and it was dustified. It was dustified. It all turned to dust. So uh, highly suspicious. But uh, another one, that they presented their evidence packages. And then there's a scientist that I've talked to once or twice, and I'm in email contact with him. He's a 42-year retired chemistry professor from the University of Copenhagen. And what happened was they uh, gathered dust out samples from around the uh, three World Trade Center uh, debris fields, and uh, they analyzed it using the scientific method, and they determined that there was a substance present called 
nanothermite, which is a highly incendiary substance that burns at a temperature of 4,000 degrees. Now, why is that important? Well, uh, jet fuel only burns at a temperature of 1,500 degrees. Steel melts at a temperature of 2,750. And yet, there were photos taken of molten iron pouring out like lava from the buildings before they collapsed. And firemen who waited in this lava-like uh, molten iron uh, for weeks afterwards, where did it come from? Well, they contend that this nanothermite was pre-placed before 9-11, and that that's what brought the buildings down. I'll, I'll cover two more people real quick, and that's the firemen. They got statements from 118 firemen who claim while they were in the building before collapse, there were explosions heard throughout the building. And when the buildings came down, it was boom, 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 boom. All the way down, there were explosions going off. So they got testimony from them. And then the final person, have, have either of you ever heard of William Rodriguez? I haven't heard of him, but I have heard of another, I think it must have been a firefighter who also heard these explosions that you were just describing. On I went to school with I went to school with a William Rodriguez. Oh, did you? <laughs> okay, well, let I me tell you his story because it's very interesting. Go ahead. Uh, William Rodriguez was a janitor in one of the towers. He maintained the cleanliness of the uh, stairwells, and uh, he was there. Were six sub basements in the uh, twin towers, and he was one on one of the middle ones. And uh, when the first airplane hit, he had uh, keys to the uh, stairwell, so he went outside and not only led, led uh, firemen uh, and police uh, up the uh, stairwell, he helped rescue people, bringing them down. And uh, he, right before the building collapsed, he ran outside and dove under a truck, and uh, a passerby saw him dive there and came back later and dug him out of the wreckage. Well, the news caught wind of this guy, who I've, I haven't talked to him, but I'm in email contact with him, but uh, they caught wind of this guy and they were saying the last man out, the hero uh, of 9-11, and Bush caught wind of those stories in the media and invited him up to Washington to receive a hero award. Well, he was surrounded by uh, congressmen, senators, uh, all telling him he's gonna run for political office, uh, tell him he's going to get a book movie deal out of this thing until William testified before a committee and said, oh, by the way, before the uh, plane hit the building, seconds before it hit, there was a huge explosion that rocked the building beneath him and the floor beneath him in the sub-basement. And a guy came out of the elevator shaft with skin dripping off of him. Well, all the fanfare and... Uh, uh, the people around him ran away from him. And William Rodriguez has spent the last uh, 19 years, I guess, traveling the world telling his story. And if you want to know more about him, uh, just go to YouTube and uh, uh, type in William Rodriguez and you can hear his story. Well, those are the evidence packages they presented. There are more than that. As a matter of fact, there were... Uh, I can't, I think 57 evidence packages they presented to the grand jury in New York. So uh, I just had a conference call with four board members of the lawyers committee several weeks ago. Right. And 45 minutes, I explained to them, here's what we're trying to do. Well, they can't legally represent us at present because they told me they have to remain objective. But if we can gather together enough evidence, I mean, affidavits from pilots around the world, uh, we'll go in on top of them and try to get force the uh, Justice Department to convene a grand jury uh, uh, investigation into uh, the what's going on. So, uh, in an effort to try to uh, recruit pilots from around the world, we've got a join us page. Uh, if you go to the top of the page, now this isn't just for pilots; it's for uh, it's for everybody. It's the general public too. If you want to join us, we'll send you out uh, email newsletters periodically. But it, we made it super simple to fill out. It's only five blocks. You type in your first name, last name, email address, your country, and phone number in case we want to call you. 
and whatever comment you want to put in there. We've got a lot of good comments coming in from around the world. But if you're a pilot, it says at the bottom, please indicate the type of aircraft that you, you've flown in the past. So we get that data and we can contact them right away and send them an affidavit. So uh, it's a good system we have up. We just, uh, the website's being read globally. We can look at the Google Analytics on it, but the numbers aren't as high as we'd like. And uh, we'd like to get this word out on what's on the website. No doubt. Uh, to everybody. Definitely, definitely. And before we get into the who, what, why, when, where, you know, the seven key questions here, before we even get into that, I, I definitely want to backtrack just a tiny bit here and okay. uh, mention how there were sort of uh, drills going on the morning of 9 11. And of course, yeah. even to backtrack even further, there were also uh, training exercises going on as well, going back to October 24th, 2000, the Pentagon, they were conducting a training exercise, I believe uh, off the top of my head, I think it was something called like Moscow. It was a... I can't remember the name of it, but you're right. They, they were, were simulating a crash of a Boeing 757 into the building if I recall correctly. So I just find it ironic that there's always some sort of a drill going on uh, slightly before an actual event happens that they're training for uh, goes down. I've always found that a little odd, wouldn't you say? Well, actually, there were several military exercises going on up in New England that day, which in part caused a lot of confusion because one of the... Uh, drills they were conducting was a simulated uh, airplane crashing into a building. So uh, I think weird. there was confusion amongst air traffic control as to whether or not what they were hearing was the real thing or part of this drill. Yeah, look at COVID-19, by the way, Dan, just to drive it even further, more drills were being conducted as well before it even happened, and even in right. China. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a strange coincidence, right, Dan? Right, right. Odd. So, very um, odd. I could, I could get in. I'll get into it a little bit later about few, a few of the characters that uh, are involved in nine eleven. I'll name a few people and. Uh, yeah, no doubt. No, but before cool. we, yeah, but but before we move on from the Pentagon, I actually have a little audio clip from one of your videos. You know, I thought it would be fascinating to play for the listeners out there. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, let's play that now. Before 9-1-1, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld declared war, not on foreign terrorists. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. He said money wasted by the military poses a serious threat. In fact, it could be said that it's a matter of life and death. Rumsfeld promised change, but the next day, the world changed. And in the rush to fund the war on terrorism, the war on waste seems to have been forgotten. My 03 budget calls for more than $48 billion in new defense spending. More money for the Pentagon when its own auditors admit the military cannot account for 25% of what it already spends. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. Flight 77 was supposedly piloted by Honey Honjur a flight school dropout who could not handle a Cessna 172, but somehow managed to steer a 757 in an 8,000 foot descending 270 degree corkscrew turn at 500 miles per hour to come exactly level with the ground. Neither experienced pilots nor aviation officials could believe that such a move could be pulled off with such precision at such high speeds by any but the most experienced pilot. Watching the flight on her radar screen, Dulles International Airport air traffic controller later remarked, the speed, the maneuverability, the way that he turned, we all thought in the radar room, all of us experienced air traffic controllers, that that was a military plane. Amazing. Dan, so I, I, go but, ahead. Before you go on, I, I have to bring this up. If, if in fact, by chance, let's just say hypothetically that the, the two planes that, well, let's just count them all, all right, for, for argument's sake. All the planes that crashed that day, if indeed you're you're claiming here with this information that you're playing and what what Captain uh, Hanley is saying, that the planes were flown 
remotely. I'll drive it even further. I'm glad you said that. Let's play another audio clip of um, Bush uh, talking about uh, these things, and we could even back it up even further. There's a long history of unmanned drones and uh, crap that's been going on for a long time, and Dan will definitely talk about that here in a moment. Let's play some Bush, because everyone loves Bush. <laughs> <laughs> UAVs of various sorts have been used since August 22nd, 1849, when Austria launched 200 pilotless, bomb-filled balloons on the city of Venice. Development of UAVs continued with radio-controlled drones and pilotless torpedoes developed in World War I, Amazing. the creation of the U.S. Air Force's pilotless aircraft branch in 1946, the deployment of military UAVs in the Vietnam War, Israel's development of the first drone with real-time surveillance capabilities in the Yom Kippur War, and U.S. use of the technology in Grenada before the birth of the modern era with the extensive deployment of pioneer drones in the first Gulf War. When it comes to the remote control of civilian aircraft, President Bush stated in late September 2001 that he would devote federal funds to developing new technologies for combating the threat of hijacking, including remote control technology. And we will look at all kinds of technologies to make sure that our airlines are safe, and for example, including technology to enable controllers to take over distressed aircrafts and land it by remote control. Amazing. Yes. That is so incredible. So can I, can I ask this question? Jump in there. All right, so here's my point. Let's just say, again, for argument's sake, that these planes were operated by remote control. In flight, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, flight 93, the one that that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Correct. Was it 93? Correct. Right. Okay. So I just watched something three days ago called Flight 93 on Netflix. And from what I understand uh, from the passengers that were on that plane who called – their loved ones I'm and so and, glad and you so brought on. that up <laughs> okay all right hold on to that thought. love hold that. On to that thought so now the people that called to their parents and their their husbands and wives and children grandparents so on and so forth they were saying that they had seen the hijackers eliminate the pilot the co-pilot and i believe one of the stewardesses if i'm correct so how how then would it have been flown automatically by the way mike we also just to add on to your question here we also have the voice of one of the alleged hijackers as well in a recording that's right yeah that's right we'll kick it up even a notch here for a dan are you gonna play something oh no dan go ahead oh okay okay <laughs> Well, first of all, the cell phone calls uh, couldn't be made at altitude on 9-11. So that's a big question that has gone unanswered, but uh, they couldn't have made the cell phone calls. Uh, as far as the uh, flight attendants making that statement, uh, if somehow they were able to make the uh, phone calls, you, I'm not, I cannot prove or disprove that there were actual hijackers on board the airplane that had boarded. Uh, I haven't looked in detail at the manifest of the flight, but if they were on there, I personally believe, and this is, I'm not speculating here, this is just uh, me guessing that perhaps they were boarded and were patsies and thought they were going to hijack an airplane, didn't realize it was going to be taken over. But uh, uh, we, can, we can get into that in a minute, but I, I know that's a big argument that cell phones couldn't be made at altitude. Well, right. With all, with all respect, Captain, uh, there were, the, uh, I, I don't know what they're called, but there's phones on the back of each seat that you can use with a credit card. And according to the flight, uh, according to the flight, according to the film that I was watching, there were also people who used their credit cards to pay uh, to get a, a, an outgoing call from those phones on, this, on the right. back of the seats. So right. that was also something to keep in mind. Yes. Um, I, can't, I can't answer that question. I, I know what you're talking about. I know they said calls were made. Right. Uh, you can go. I don't know if either one of you have ever heard of Rebecca Roth. Of course. Okay. Well, she wrote 
three books, Methodical Illusion, Methodical Deception, and Methodical Conclusion. And she didn't write them herself. Uh, she was a Facebook friend, and we exchanged messages. She was a former United, American Airlines flight attendant. And when she started writing these books, when she started uh, suspecting that the government had lied to her about 9-11, she told me that uh, pilots, engineers, uh, mechanics, uh, FBI people, CIA people came rushing in, remaining anonymous to dump all this information on her for her to write the book. But I personally haven't read the books myself, but I've watched her YouTube videos and read some articles on her. And she alleges that the aircraft were electronically hijacked, all four of them taken to Stewart, I'm not Stewart Air Force Base, to uh, uh, Westover Air Force Base up in New England, forced to make phone calls, and then we're snuffed. Now, I can't prove or disprove that, but that's one of the theories floating out around, floating around out there. So, uh, but I, I want to point out something because I'm very active on social media, and I get attacked by people saying there's no planes. There was none in Shanksville. They used holograms to hit the uh, tires. A missile hit the Pentagon. There was a flyover. So I've heard all those arguments, but I want to point out on our website our sole focus is on the hijackers themselves. And if we can disprove that they flew the airplane, then the whole official story falls apart. Okay, so then, that, that being said, Mr. Captain Hanley, I, I got to bring this up. So why then, after this all went down, why did Al-Qaeda uh, claim responsibility? Why did they, they show footage, uh, video footage that was found after we went into Afghanistan why did they show footage of, of uh, bin Laden uh, talking about how he set up the arrangements for the hijacking, uh, as well as many of, of the, uh, the lovely uh, Muslims who were celebrating the death of 3,000 people? How did that happen? If, if there was no association with the Muslim terrorists, why were they claiming responsibility? Well... I'd have to ask you who produced those videos because I've heard uh, people claim that they were produced by the Department of Defense, but getting back to bin Laden claiming responsibility, he made a lengthy statement on Al Jazeera, and he also wrote a letter saying that he denies any responsibility for 9-11 and that it goes against Islam and that he didn't do it. So it depends upon who you want to believe. I see. You got to remember, there's propaganda on all sides. It's part of the I, mind war. I, I it's totally all about. That. It's all about the mind war, my friend. If you go back throughout history, you can see that our country has been responsible for a number of false flag operations throughout time. I mean, there's do it's documented. I'm not making this up. I believe you. Well, I'm not you making this up. Off the top of your head? Yeah, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which is a good indicator of where a lot of Americans can start if they haven't already heard of uh, these of uh, false flag operations if they want to go into it i would say that's probably the best place uh the the very first thing you should look into is the gulf of tonkin incident and of course it's right. all it's all documented you could read it for yourself that's how we got into the war well all right accident uh, or Michael, not go ahead jump in there go back even further than that you can go back to operation northwood or operation um, northwood another example yeah yeah, that was in 1962 or 1963. The Joint Chiefs of Staff handed an operation to the Department of Defense, who turned it over to Kennedy. And what it included was uh, they wanted to go to war with Cuba, and they wanted an excuse. And this Operation Northwood was a plan to attack Guantanamo, uh, U.S. ship, hijack airplanes, and a number of other things, so they would have an excuse to go into Cuba and. Uh, Kennedy nixed the plan, so that's that's really the first false flag I heard of that uh, they proposed and it, it didn't go, but you're right about the Gulf of Tonkin. Oh yes, and to be honest with you, a lot of my thoughts and opinions on 9-11 uh, from early on, early 2000s, have not changed very much. I knew back then something was off and I didn't base that off of faith because faith is not a reliable pathway to truth. Observation in history has been a solid indicator of what is more likely to be true. Amen. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't even know where that came from, but that is a fact. Yes. I'm sorry. I know it's it's hard. It's a hard pill to swallow that a lot of these things are going on in the background and um we're we're kind of um insignificant to be honest dan Th these things are going to be carried out whether we like it or not whether we believe in it or not sad right cap right. captain captain henley I, I gotta tell you since i've joined the show with michael and become his co-host over the past several months I have explained to him how complicated it has been for me to accept certain things that have been <laughs> considered. Yeah, you laugh. I love you that. Devil. No, he told me. Yeah. He so, told me that. <laughs> so I have a lot of issues accepting some of the con uh, the conspiracy theories that have been laid upon us. Con First of all, let's just start right off with 9-11. Uh, I have – since the event has taken place, I have watched multitudes – of uh, controversial um, circumstances and and conspiracy theories on YouTube and and you know Facebook and whatever was out in uh, oh golly uh, probably as late as 2008. 911 is um, my JFK, by the way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's been very very difficult for me to accept what I have seen and heard. Yet, I will be per perfectly honest. I am open to suggestion. So when I see these things. It's fascinating, right, Mike? It's fascinating. It is, no, I know. Without a doubt, Michael, without I a doubt. You. But what I say to Captain Hanley is, you know, I'm trying to really dig my teeth into this and understand. It, let me back up. I have such a hard time thinking that my government would kill me or let, let me let me take it even a step further, would kill 3,000 people fly a plane into the World Trade Centers uh, uh, and, and, a, and a, one into the Pentagon and one into a field of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. I have a real hard time accepting that. Did you have a hard so time I, believing uh, have, Benghazi, by the way, Mike? That's, a, that's another good example. I'm sorry, one at a time. Michael, what did you say? I was going to say, do you have a hard time believing Benghazi happened? No, I don't. Well, a lot of people uh, I, on the believe... left think that's a conspiracy. Uh, again, yeah. I and that's what I'm saying. I mean, uh, and I, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, I believe Benghazi, which was, you know, you got Hillary Clinton telling them to stand, or not actually Hillary Hillary Clinton, but... Uh, well, depending on who you ask, they, they say that never happened. Yeah. See, never I, happened. See, I, I have a hard totally time believing that too. Bengal <laughs> I think Benghazi was a total sham and, and an insult to the country. Well, to some people, uh, it never happened. Right. Amazing. And, and Captain Hanley, what did you say? Did you say Benghazi as well? No, I wasn't mentioning Benghazi. You were talking about having a hard time. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Dan. The U.S. government become involved. But I, Speak on I that, didn't Dan. claim yet, and I won't, which countries were involved in 9-11 because that's, uh, that's up for arguments, too. So... Uh, uh, was it necessarily I, the U.S. government? Uh, that's a question that needs to be answered. Yeah, Saudi I, Arabia I've heard, having I've a hand heard in it too. Say that it was Israel or Israel, right? Uh, you have to look. I mean, uh, crime has a a means and a motive, and you have to look at who had the means and what motive they had for possibly doing it. Now, I have a hard time accepting that a skinny man living in a cave with a laptop and a a cell phone, commanded 19 angry hijackers to commandeer four airplanes, evade the most sophisticated air defense system in the world for over an hour, and crash three of them into buildings. There's other people that had greater motive for doing this than bin Laden. And we can get about, into that What about the later. terrorists? What about the, 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 the so-called terrorists who went to the flight schools? I mean... Yeah, we can, we can get into that, and I want to... Uh, Mike, uh, and I want to ask you, David, because uh, I'm not looking at what the uh, viewers are looking at on their screen. Do you have a slideshow going, or can you pop up uh, different photos that I sent you? Did you just refer to me as David? Yeah, he did. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I've been on too many programs. I was going to say, David. That's okay. That's a word. That's a word, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, right now, the listeners can only see a photographic of you right now, and Okay. You know, by the way, uh, in regards to these uh, hijackers, 
I remember there was some sort of rumor way back in the early 2000s of these alleged 19 hijackers having had turned up somewhere alive and well in like Saudi Arabia. BBC had an article on that, but there's a 9-11 whistleblower named Kevin Barrett who claims that uh, he uh, investigated that and it wasn't true, but I, I heard the same thing that uh, they had shown up alive in a few places and had stolen uh, IDs uh, to get into the country. So I can't, I can't confirm or deny that. Uh, I can't either. Right now. Yeah. I was just curious what you thought of that. That's, um, I've uh, always wondered, that's a little odd, but yes, um, I, I guess that's a possibility. I don't know. I got my work cut out convincing Mike, uh, of what my <laughs> statement was at the beginning. Um, well, you know, you I, at... I want, I want you to know, captain, uh, I don't, I'm not insulting your intelligence or your theory. It's my no, no, job to ask, it's my job to ask hard questions. Right, right. Well, they're I just know. questions. <laughs> and uh, you're supposed to ask. But if you look, if you look at a photograph, that's why I was asking this, uh, Michael, if you look at a photograph of the cockpit of a 172, which was the primary flight training aircraft for these hijackers, okay, uh, there's no instruments on the co-pilot side. The left side has the old round dial instruments. Uh, there's a few knobs on the lower panel. There's a throttle, a mixture, and a carburetor heat. And you contrast that with a photo of a 767 cockpit. Okay, it's a world of difference. Uh, we profile it, this on the on the website. The instruments for starter are CRT displays that have a wealth of information. But this is the this is the key here. Uh, on the center pedestal, there's two flight management computers, and that's the primary navigation system for the aircraft. These guys could not hop in this airplane, and you'd see all the uh, dials and switches on the center pedestal and, and up on the, uh, the instrument panel. These guys could not go up slit throats, hop in the seat, uh, analyze what they're looking at, and fly these aircraft. And we got at the bottom of the photos, do you notice any subtle differences? So. Uh, that that's our first uh, contention that there's no way. But you were talking about the hijackers themselves having training. We got a whole page that, devoted to them. Well, let's we kick it up a little bit here, uh, Dan. Just on that yeah. note, um, again, you said you and you've stated this many times. N there were no Muslims involved in the hijacking, yet right. there has been video footage of several of these alleged hijackers entering an airport. Does that mean the footage was falsified? Well, if you look, the one footage I saw, there was a, a time at the bottom where they're walking through and they show the time of the day and it's right. moving real fast. Uh, and the one uh, I saw a film of, and I don't know if it's authentic or not, that, that wasn't there when the guy is walking through uh, security. So... Uh, like again, like I say, they they may well have boarded the air. We know that they train. They've got a a, a training trail. Right, that right. We proved that they they train. Uh, but whether or not they were on the airplane, uh, I contend is irrelevant because uh, of uh, the system that I was talking about, the uninterruptible autopilot. Yeah, you don't even uh, need to. Even if they were on the airplane and that was engaged, right. there's no way of turning it off. Exactly, so, exactly. And I was just going to say, they don't really need to learn too much if the autopilot was going to be turned on, right? No, no, they'd still have to know a lot. You still have to know uh, a lot, okay. They'd still have to know a lot. But uh, th there's no way they could mm -hmm. get in and interpret the instrumentation and the flight management computers, given that they only flew single engine light Cessna aircraft. So that must have been really difficult for them to pull off these maneuvers. Impossible. There you go. I mean, if, if you look at that simulator uh, recreation of the uh, a Pentagon profile, uh, even the most experienced pilot that I know couldn't do it. So, and I'd like to go down and just cover briefly go ahead. The, the experience level of each one of these uh, hijackers. Uh, the first being Mohammed Ada, who was an Egyptian, and he was the supposed ringleader of the hijackers that flew a uh, American flight. 11 into the North uh, North Tower. He was the first one to hit. He's age 33 and he commenced flying in June 2000 and had a commercial and incident rating 
and he hit the building at 465 miles an hour. Now, you got to understand, a jet, a heavy jet aircraft, especially at that speed with the control pressures on the yoke, is, in, is incredibly different than a Cessna 172 aircraft. But the, air, the flight path was basically a straight-in approach from the NARS at this incredible speed. And I didn't come up with this analogy but the precision required to execute this maneuver would be equivalent to accelerating a large semi-tractor trailer to over 500 miles per hour and driving it through a jiffy loop without scraping the sides <laughs> of the truck wow. without ever having driven the truck before. That's how accurate it, they would have had to have been. And I can get into in a minute, well, I will right now, the South Tower. There was a guy named uh, Marvin al Shahi. He was from the UAE, and he was in uh, the pilot of... Uh, United Flight 175 that crashed into the South Tower. This guy was only 23 years of age, commenced flying in June of 2000, and had a commercial rating. He was the fastest airplane. He hit it at 590 miles per hour. Now, this is kind of critical. He approached the South Tower uh, in a descending left-hand turn, accelerating to that speed. But within 12 seconds to impact, the aircraft, you've probably seen it on a film, makes a slight left turn with a bank angle of about 20 degrees to strike, precisely strike the building. Had the aircraft not made that turn at exactly that moment with the correct angle of bank, the aircraft would have missed the building by 800 feet. And that's a maneuver we claim couldn't have even been performed by the most experienced pilot at that speed because of the reaction time required. So we don't really profile those two pilots and uh, their experience that much. It's Hani Hanjur, the one we talked about before that was the uh, Pentagon pilot. He was doing 530 miles per hour when he hit the Pentagon. I already discussed his, uh, his the profile that he flew, but we put some notes on here, and I, I'm going to be reading some of them because they're quotes from newspaper, but we mentioned he only trained in a uh, single-engine Cessna, and he never flown a, a, a jet before. But in January, two, now, he is one of the hijackers that came to school in the mid-90s in the States and then went back to Saudi Arabia but, uh, and came back shortly before 9-11. The whole visa but thing, January, by the way, is, is very odd to me. The whole what? The whole visa thing. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, there were some issues, if I recall, with, with the hijackers. Um, if I recall... Um, if memory serves correctly, I believe the 19 hijackers applied for the 23 visas and only obtained 22. Oh, really? I believe so. I they were, heard. yeah, they were like denied. I believe five of them were denied. Okay. And yeah. It's, it's very odd once you really dig into this and see how this went down. Um, very unusual. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry to throw you off there. Okay, I'll get back into Hani here. Uh, yes. In January 2001, Arizona Jet Flight Tech school managers reported him to the FAA at least five times because his English was inadequate, inadequate for a commercial license. And it took him five hours to complete an oral exam meant to last just two hours. That was from uh, this woman at the school. Uh, and he failed uh, English classes with a .26 grade point average and the jet tech manager said he could not fly at all. In August 2001, and this is important, he began making cross-country flights to test security, and he tried to rent a plane from the freeway airport in Maryland, and he was declined even renting an airplane after exhib exhibiting difficulty in controlling and landing a single-engine Cessna 172. Well, that was in August, the month before. And this is according to the 9-11 Commission, he began training in earnest, but in reality, while at CRM, Andre never finished coursework required to get a certificate to be able to fly a single-engine airplane. The New York Times reported that he was a lackadaisical student who often cut classes and never displayed the passion so common among budding commercial airline pilots. Then ABC News reported that he, when he returned to CRM, he was trying for his private pilot's license but according to one of his instructors, he was a very poor student who skipped homework and missed flights. The school attorney said that when Hanja re re reapplied in late 2000, 
we declined to provide him training because we didn't think he was a good enough student when he was there in 96 and 97. The school's owner described him as a weak student who was wasting our resources. He said one of the first accomplishments of someone in flight school is to fly a plane without an instructor. And finally, the Chicago Tribune reported that at CRM, a flight instructor said Hanjir left an impression of being unimpressive, quote, he was making weak progress. And that was from the president at CRM. So what we have here is a smoking gun amongst uh, the hijackers. We got this guy that flew single engine airplanes could barely handle those, and yet we're led to believe that at 590, or however fast he was, over 500 miles per hour, he was able to approach the Pentagon after the cart's crew turned, and this is critical. He was able to strike it at ground level without skidding the surface and hit the Office of Naval Intelligence, and I can get to, into the, that in a minute, without sk uh, skidding the surface. Well, on a heavy jet airplane, there's something called wingtip vortices, okay? Uh, they're created as the little vortices or tornadoes, I'll call them, are generated beneath the wing and dissipated off the wingtip. And they occur about one wingspan width above the ground. And, and what, what happens when you get down close to the ground, you experience this on landing, is uh, it provides a cushioning effect and the airplane tends to float. Now on the landing, if you, you're floating and you experience this and you recognize it, you just shove the nose over a little bit. But for this the guy at that speed to fly through ground effects at that altitude and hit the, that office is an impossibility. Can I, can I ask you a question, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Captain Hanley? Yeah. In your own personal opinion, why do you, if indeed all of this is true, if your theory is true, why well, do you think- so far I've only what, given you facts, Mike. Uh, uh, okay, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if, if it's, because I mean, obviously we don't, we don't have uh, a, there's no, uh, how do I say this? It hasn't been officially spoken about that it actually, what you're saying actually happen so so it all just just entertain me for this question if okay. in if indeed all of this is true what do you think the cause of this what like why why did this happen the way it did i mean why did 90 why did uh were airplanes crashed into building yeah why do you think it was it was happening and if it did happen the, the way you're saying it happened why do you think the government would have done it? If indeed it was the government that did it, why do you think they did it? I can only speculate and I don't like to do it, but I'll, I'll bring in two countries possible, okay? I mentioned before the means and motive. Well, I'll get into remote aircraft in a minute here, but the means were available to remotely control the aircraft. Now, what was the motive? Well. Uh, we've seen in the aftermath what happened in the Middle East and South Asia, okay? Uh, we've seen a military industrial uh, complex reap $6 trillion in, in benefits. That money went somewhere. And we also know that based on statements made prior to 9-11, they were looking for a new Pearl Harbor. Are you aware of uh, Dobbs Ockheim and the paper wrote uh, Rebuilding America's Defensive one year prior to 9-11? I'm afraid I don't. Okay, well in that paper, he states that the United States needs a new Pearl Harbor to, to garner public support for increased defense spending in the future. And a year later, they got their Pearl Harbor. So uh, those would be the motive. The means would be having access to remote technology. But the other country you can ask who had a motive? Have you ever heard of the Greater Israel Project? I'm afraid not. I love that oh. you mentioned that. Go ahead. Okay. The Greater Israel Project, also known as the Oded Yenon Plan. Oh, they. Uh, it has to do with the land that uh, Israel claims is the promised land. Now, you can, uh, you can Google this, and there's a great uh, global research article on this that goes into detail on their motivation, okay? But their, their motive would be to destabilize countries in the Middle East 
which happened after uh, 9-11. So those are two possible suspects, but I'm not going to guess, and I probably said more than I should have anyhow, but uh, those I, would be I, reasons. Go ahead. Go on. No, 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 no. Go ahead. You get. No, I said those would be reasons why those two countries could possibly be involved. And I'm see. not saying the whole U.S. government was involved. If you look at what uh, who the neocon uh, Zionist neocons uh, Zionists that surrounded uh, Bush at the time, you can see Dobbs Ockheim, the author of that uh, that paper. He's a dual U.S. Israeli citizen. He's been in uh, government in the United States since the Reagan era. era. He was Bush's uh, national security advisor during the, the first uh, uh, term of Bush in office, right before 9-11. But he was also CEO of a company called System Planning Corporation, SPC. And they developed a system called the Flight Termination System. Now, what this system is for, it, it was originally designed uh, on, for missile tests in the event of a misfire, they can remotely take control of the airborne vehicle and either blow it up in the air or drive it to a safe uh, location and crash land the thing. So uh, that's what uh, oh, heck, Rebecca Roth <clears throat> in her books alludes to, the fact that it was Dobbs Ockheim. Now, this same character, Dobbs Ockheim, Four months before 9-11 in April, Bush appoints him as comptroller of the Pentagon to oversee uh, the day before 9-11, as was evidence on that video, uh, $2.3 trillion went missing from the Pentagon budget. And Dobbs Ockheim was a comptroller that oversaw the auditors that were looking into this, uh, this missing money. Well, guess where? Uh, the Boeing 757 hit. The Office of Naval Intelligence that houses those offices that killed 34 off of those auditors and destroyed all the records. What a coincidence. a coincidence. I don't know. What a coincidence indeed. They just how happened many, to hit people, on that side. How many people died in, wow. in the Pentagon? 34? Oh, no. Those are just auditors, Mike. But they died from the... From the, from the uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was mostly oh. an empty side, really. Not too many people were there. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, they were well, having construction, if I recall. I want to point out a couple things Jumping that there. I missed before. The reason I'm doing this, or not me, I've got a group of guys behind the scene, but the reason we're doing this is because not one pilot was allowed to testify before the 9-11 Commission as is the absurdity of this notion that the pilots flew the aircraft, okay? And there's never been a criminal investigation into 9-11. The 9-11 Commission wasn't, so we want a criminal investigation. But uh, uh, going back to sus suspect, I don't know if you know who Michael Chertoff is or what was. He was the head of the criminal division at the Department of Justice on 9-11. And he was the one that ordered all steel to be hauled off from the uh, debris field and without any forensic evidence being taken and shipped to China at below market rates and sold. Uh, he went on to become the Secretary of Homeland Security. He helped write the Patriot Act. And after he left government, he went to work as a consultant for a company named Rapiscon. And guess what they did? They're the ones that developed the body scanners that you see in the airport. So he, he's a suspect char char character. His mom was a Mossad agent. Uh, I can't remember what function his dad had, but he's a dual US Israeli citizen. And uh, it, his resume causes you to raise some eyebrows. So I'm not, I'm not saying yes, the US and Israel did 9-11. I'm saying that there may have been rogue elements rogue Zionist elements within the United States and Israel that planned and executed the event. Right. And of course, you mentioned uh, PNAC, the project for the new American century. Right. Uh, you, you forgot to mention some of the uh, top administrators there, by the way. We had uh, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, by the way. So, I mean, you had all these uh, interesting 
uh, players involved in this uh, think tank. And yes, there was a quote that there was a pamphlet and they talked about a new Pearl Harbor like event. Uh, very interesting indeed. Well, there's another whistleblower named Karen, uh, I can't pronounce her last name, Kwiatkowski. Um, she worked outside the Office of Special Plans in the Pentagon. And she saw Rumsfeld, Cheney, and Paul Wolfowitz gathered together in a room. And what they were planning, and this is before uh, the Iraq invasion, they were planning for the invasion in, into Iraq. So they knew they were going in there. They were looking for an excuse. And they went in there based on a lie. Indeed. Indeed. And, of course, I'm seeing the dancing Israelis here in the chat room. Right. Right. Talk to us about that. can't forget them either. Yeah, man. Go ahead. I got to point something out. Michael Chertoff, the guy that was head of the criminal division, not only released the dancing Israelis to go back to Israel, but there were, I can't remember the number, there were Israeli spies that were caught in the, caught in the country, and he shipped them back, too. And they actually uh, admitted to these facts uh, when they got back to Israel. So, uh that's, that's why I raised my eyebrows when I mentioned the name. Uh, and then you can also mention Larry Silverstein. That's right. And uh, the World Trade Center complex. Larry Silverstein, for those that don't know it, six weeks before 9-11, leased out the entire World Trade Center complex because he had a compelling desire to own it. Now, Larry normally went up to the Windows on the World restaurant at the top of the Twin Towers with his uh, uh, kids. To have breakfast every morning, but he made a doctor's appointment that morning, and he fortunately uh, wasn't up there. They call him Lucky Larry. Well, now Larry, Larry is a personal friend of Benjamin Netanyahu. I was totally talking to him once a week. Larry insured these buildings, the whole complex, for ten billion dollars, and uh, he after 9/11 he sued. And I think he got $4.3 billion because they said it was a two separate terrorist attack. That's right. For the, for the, for, uh, as, as a reward for uh, insuring the building. So, and also, Lucky Larry, by the way. What's that? I said Lucky Larry, by the way, his nickname. Exactly. Exactly. So those are three people. I mean, Larry isn't a dual U.S. Israeli citizen, but I, uh, You've got to look at the power and influence that the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, has on government in this country. And for people that aren't familiar with APAC, I just say go ahead and look it up, Google it, and see what they're all about. But uh, I uh, took an oath of office to support, as an officer in the Navy, to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, I allege that we have some domestic enemies within our government, and somehow we need to purge them. Because the president, his cabinet, all members of Congress took that same oath of office. And talking about APAC, you can talk about Cynthia McKinney, a former congresswoman turned whistleblower who came out and spilled her guts and said that all congressional leaders have to sign the pledge the oath of allegiance to Israel. That's right. Uh, uh, or your career is ruined as a politician. So they, and no one in this country will force Israel or APAC to be registered as a foreign agent. But you talk about Soviet meddling, or Soviet, my age again. <laughs> you talk about Russian. <laughs> well, you flew, by the way, Dan, during the Cold War era. Yes. Amazing. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're, now you're really pushing it. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, <man. laughs> by the way, Dan, it, by the way, Dan, uh, we are coming to a close. Not yet, but uh, soon. Again, I, I still want to say I'm quite excited that I have had you here on the program. Always interesting to get yes. your point of view, Dan, someone that actually has skin in the game. And uh, it's quite fascinating, Dan, uh, to have you here. I, I can't yes, stop saying you, that. Dan. Well, yeah. I'm, 
I'm pleased that you invited me, David and uh, David. <laughs> David. There I go again. I'm just going to call know, myself I'm gonna start David. Calling him from now on, Captain. <laughs> Michael. Michael. If we're going to call my, we're going to call me David now. I'm going to start calling I you David like from now on, Mike. People, I just like to encourage people to go to menu and look at the drop-down menu at Remote Control Aircraft because there's some very interesting videos there. Right. And I'd hope to get into it, but we're out of time. Oh yes, but Dan, before we even forget about anything. I definitely want you to tell us about the show that you were doing, Dan. You were a host yourself. You were talking to other pilots as well. Right. Yeah, tell us well, about that. It was called the Whistleblowing Airline Employee Blog Talk Radio Program, and I ran it for about a year until I ran out of guests to come on. But it wasn't just pilots. There were air marshals, uh, air traffic controllers, uh, mechanics, uh a number of people that were in the aviation industry and what i do is be bring them on just like you brought me on the program here right and have them tell their story as a whistleblower but by four of the other pilots that i brought on had their career terminated the same way i did running them uh running by a strength and i didn't get a chance to talk about phil mcconnell my friend i devoted a page to him on the website he they were trying to do that to him, and he retired early so he could serve as an expert witness. But he's the first one in 2006 that told me about the uninterruptible autopilot, and uh, right. I owe it to him. But anyhow, I probably talked too much. I hope people didn't get bored listening to me. Oh, not at all, not at all. I think people are completely fascinated with you. And um, Dan, we haven't even talked about your personal life uh, today. I mean, it, it hasn't ended well for those that were listening the first half of the program. They think perhaps you're like this lonely man now, but you know, you <laughs> sort of regrouped yourself and you actually no longer live in America. You actually have That's a, correct. yes, sir. You actually have a brand new life, uh, Dan, go ahead and talk to us about that. Okay. I'll make it brief, but, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, I, I wasn't going to marry again. I stayed single for about four years. But in uh, 2010, I met, fell in love with, and married a Pakistani. And uh, she had family in Islamabad. And she's a news anchor for the biggest TV station here. So uh, when we got married, uh, I've stayed here and I've lived here ever since. Uh, the people have been very warm and friendly to me. I'm happily married. I uh, have a family here, a grandchild, and uh, some people have accused me of hiding out here, but nothing could be further from the truth. That's right. And what's life like out there for you um, right now, uh, Dan? Is everything going well? And of course, uh, what is uh, COVID like? Uh, COVID nineteen uh, like rather out there? Is there an issue with that at all, or is that oh, something? Yes, that... Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we're right next door to China, and uh, wow. We've been in lockdown. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had to have my wife cut my hair the other day. Really? It was growing so long. But uh, the prime minister last week said he was going to open everything up, and they had the virus spike. So they're not going to close everything down, but they're circling the wagons again and closing some shops and that. But, yeah, they've been devastated by it. And, uh, Pakistan's not a rich country, and they're heavily indebted to the IMF. And... Uh, their economy was already in trouble. They've been relying on loans from uh, China, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and a few other countries trying to keep the economy afloat. But I, I worry about what impact uh, this COVID is going to have uh, given, on, uh, given what's happened to the economy here. Wow. And how is the new wife, by the way? She's okay. She's not sick or anything. No one in the family is sick, right? Oh, no, no, no. Every, everyone's healthy. Okay, we've fantastic. Been, uh, we've been housebound and uh, maybe climbing the walls a little bit, but I've kept busy with other people back in the States uh, doing programs like this and coordinating what we're doing. So I got a couple of really good uh, web designers that built the uh, site for us. So we work with them. They are in part manage the mailing system we have. We uh, spend a few hundred bucks on a mailing system that's very efficient so we're hoping to get the word out increase readership on the site and if you go to the site we've got a social media 
uh, buttons up at the top. If uh, you go to a page and you want to share that page, just we'd appreciate it because we know the part of social media out there as far as getting the word out. Right, right, right. That's 911pilots.org where you can hear, Correct. where you can read rather more about Dan Hanley and of course watch more of his videos and get up to date right. with what's going on. With, uh, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm glad you brought up videos because we have a YouTube channel at 911 Pilots if you want to subscribe to that. Very nice. And of course, Max Cole in the chat room did ask a question for you, uh, Dan. He said, this is an interesting theory. However, what would be the motive? And that was from a listener in the chat room. And I think you kind of already answered that. But go ahead. And well, I thought I had. Yeah, I thought you did already. So... Well, the mo motive for elements within the U.S. would be the money reaped from uh, by the uh, military-industrial uh, complex, which would be about six trillion, and U uh, U.S. hegemony uh, in the Middle East and South Asia. Because uh, you got to look at uh, Afghanistan and the tug of war going on there. Between it's, it's geopolitically important. Plus, there is about. Uh, Three trillion dollars worth of uh, precious lithium, uh, precious metals, and gems in the ground in Afghanistan, and no one there to mine them out. So you could look at about five or six different reasons why the United States would want to go in there. Not the United States. Certain people within the government would would have wanted to go in there on 9/11. Understood. And Dan, we definitely are coming to a close here, but I also wanted to ask you what your thoughts and opinions were on the latest uh, riots going on around the world and, of course, in America in terms of the uh, police incident that happened. Well, unfortunately, I don't speak Urdu, even though I've been here for uh, 10 years, but the only English stations I get over here are BBC and CNN. And I usually don't watch CNN because I feel like they're so biased. But <laughs> what, report, yes. what reports I've seen on the news here, I'm astounded at what's going on. Uh, I, I wonder who's going to come out on top in the election in November, uh, given some of the statements that Trump made lately and the way CNN's pounding away at him. So I really don't have a comment other than to say... Uh, I, like everyone else, I'm astounded at what's happening. And right, uh, right. I think, I think with the racial divide in the country, and uh, with Trump stand versus Biden's on certain issues, that it'll the election will further divide the country. Amazing. Oh, no doubt. There's no doubt. If if in fact President Trump wins the election, it's gonna there are there are going to be more riots. More riots, and yeah. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I, uh, not to interrupt everybody here, but I got to say there was a, an interview I heard, oh, maybe three or four months ago. It's definitely winter. And I heard them talking about people who are on the left who are preparing that if in the event oh, no. President Trump re is reelected, they're going all out with guns and they're they're going on a rampage that that, that is yeah i'm not even making it up that's that was a an undercover interview of a guy involved in uh i want to say antifa but i don't think it was it was just a far a far left radical group right right, well, right. i'll show my age when i say this but i haven't seen uh this much of a outpouring since the vietnam war or when Martin Luther King was marching on the streets. And if you think about after 9-11, uh, the Bush administration established free speech zones where people that were, say, opposed to the illegal invasion of uh, Iraq without warrant were herded off into a court in the off area, and the media didn't even co cover their, their, uh, their outrage. So. That's all gone by the wayside, and I heard there's going to be a million-man march on uh, D.C., so the plot thickens uh, to be continued. That's right. Well, again, Dan, I do want to thank you tremendously for being a part of the program. I've enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you had fun too, Dan. Yes. Oh, I, I had a great time, and I really appreciate you having me on, Michael, not David. David. <laughs> 
Yeah, David thanks Deacon. so much, Captain. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you, and thanks for putting up with my tough questions. Yeah, thank you for your service, oh, Dan. Good. They were good. We'll talk thank soon. You. Take care, Dan. Okay, bye-bye. Mahalo. Bye-bye. And uh, there he goes, boys and girls, Mr. Dan Handley. What a guest that was. Very, very interesting. And, of course, we are seeing the civil unrest going on in America. Lots of people are angry. Most people are very pissed off. You could thank the media for that. All the uh, pundits out there getting you triggered over nothing. Uh, you could thank them for that. Uh, I don't understand why some of you out there want to get so bothered by what you see in the news. It's all bullshit anyways. Don't let your emotions get the best of you, boys and girls. And uh, Mike, um, before we got on the air, you were telling me about some uh, some rally that went on the next town over to you. What happened? Oh, yeah. It wasn't nearly uh, as, you know, I as mean, bad. it was just a, a demonstration. Right, right. And it was peaceful. So I'm totally cool with that. You sure. Know, it's, it's the American freedom of speech. Uh, I may not agree with what they said, but I will f die for their right to peacefully offer their freedom of speech. Right. Um, wasn't a, you know, we were all prepared uh, for for any violence that may have taken place, but the fact of the matter is, it was peaceful. That's good. And and I'm glad that it was that way. But on the on the downside. Uh, in Pennsylvania, particularly in my county, Wayne County, northeastern Pennsylvania, a lot of the business businesses just opened up as far as I, I want to say very late May and, and I think the first of January, uh, June. And all of a sudden, this demonstration takes place yesterday and all the businesses shut down at like one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I know that because I had to go to the drugstore to get something from my pharmacy. Mm. And uh, I, I literally had to drive right by it. It was I was on the very street where they were having the demonstration. And I'll uh, tell you, mm -hmm. I was locked and loaded. Uh, you were yeah, you were strapped. I was strapped, buddy. I, sh I sent you a picture <laughs> that you did. You did. And of course, there was uh, a rally out here outside the courthouse in my town. But of course, we don't have that many people. And I was even asked if uh, I was safe out here and I, I was just. Uh, laughing there's not enough people out here to warrant the arrival or presence of a, of a of a group like antifa that's that's just not a reality out here well i've learned that um they have you know they tend to travel and it's pretty much in the bigger cities yeah of course uh, places like here. my my community or i should say my town my area uh, and even your area, yeah, too small. Would all do res yeah? Would all do respect? We we don't we don't mean anything. You know, it's places like yeah. New York and L A. Bigger and, cities, and, and, yeah. Yeah, Boston and all that crap. And I got to bring this up too, Michael. I did some research on Black Lives Matter. Oh, go ahead. And I found a couple things, and it's not everything, but it's a few things that they are they are demanding, uh, which I find absolutely repulsive. Uh, the first and foremost, uh, mm -hmm. defend, defund police. Oof, yeah, you know, I, I can't support that. I, I, I know too many police officers as it is. Yeah, me too. I, I mean, I, I don't exactly, I, I can't ride with that, Mike, you know. No, then that no. means who who's going to want to become a cop if you defund the whole thing? Well, that's the point. Um, you, you know, I mean, I have a couple of things I want to go over, but to, to touch on this subject, I was under the impression, and, and in fact, I, I believe I even heard it on the radio yesterday, that Hollywood uh, stars are actually supporting this. No, this, of course. This, of course yeah, they are. And I, I got to tell you, if that's the case, I hope Beverly Hills burns. <laughs> I hope every rich movie star with their billion-dollar houses and their limousines and their security, uh, uh, their security um, co- uh, security systems and their 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 guards and so on. i hope they burn if this happens burn it down because let, let's think about it man let's think about it if in the event that there's a problem and listen at some point in your life at every every person's life you're gonna end up calling the police for something maybe at some point in yeah. your life you call the police for something so who are they gonna call that's ghostbusters? right ghostbusters yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right so that that aside one of the other things that they're asking is the the release of all political black prisoners, uh, free college for all black minorities, 
free income for all black minorities, if, even if you're, you haven't worked. Reformations for blacks from Caucasian people. Uh, Lilith in the chat room, by the way, is saying, let the police have a nice paid vacation till further notice. That, you know what? I say the same thing. People are going to burn know, it down if you do that. It, you know, I, I, I say that, but at the same time, I feel for people who are elderly or, or uh, you know, who don't have their own protection or wouldn't know a goddamn thing what to do if they were attacked, um, such as people like you and myself who are protected, uh, you know, ourselves, uh, the old-fashioned way. Like, Armed, ready, and with all points of my fists, knees, and elbows, yes. Got that right. I'm a fucking so, animal, by the way. I know you are. I, I beat the shit are. out of a lot of people in my life. I just want you to know I, that I, on the record, on the I record, would never screw around with you, man. You're, I got you're, out you're of it. Hardcore. I got out of assault, by the way. What do you mean? I got out of a lot of assault uh, charges that were oh, pending. Oh. For the record, okay. yeah. Okay. I know well, people. Look, let's put it that way. Look, man. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is that I. With this ridiculous motion of or notion of uh, people saying defund police departments, I laugh. I'm like, you, you, you people are absolute idiots. What would you do if your mother is being beaten or it's a little, raped? It's a little ridiculous. Like, why? Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? I mean, come on, man. Who are you going to call? So it's stupid. It's absolutely stupid. I'm going to call 411. And, 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 and I got to bring this up, too. Look, we have seen Minneapolis burn. We have seen riots in New York City, L.A., and, and, and other uh, cities. So when, when I heard about this demonstration taking place in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, of all places, <laughs> right. it, it, it's like a mile long. Not even. It's a half a mile long. That's the, that's the size of the city. I said to myself, Okay, so basically, what are they? What are they saying? Like, we didn't get the point yet. Like, we haven't seen all the the chaos taking place on television. What now? You got to bring it to you know, small town USA. That's the and, goal. And, I mean, what's what's the point? Like, I didn't see this already on television. That's the goal, Mike. They want to spread their word, and of course, Buffalo cops resign from unit in protest after two of their own are suspended for injuring a seventy five year old man. By the way, there was a video going around social media that showed uh officers pushing a 75 year old man to the ground mike by the way and of course i saw that video on twitter and i of course uh, retweeted that mike and i had said I, I didn't think the police showed enough excessive force they should have they should have stomped that thug out mike that caucasian thug that old caucasian thug what did he do he was just standing in the way of the uh, cops there they told him to move and he stood there and they pushed his ass down and, and he was a protester? I don't know if he was protesting, but he didn't move. He should have. And the cops moved his ass out of the way. Look, man, I, I don't know what's so hard to understand. I, I grew up, my father was a, a captain. On he the was a thug, department. Mike, that, that old man. So he got what was coming to him. Right, and agreed. And, and what I'm getting at is this. Um, I was born and raised in a family of firefighters and ambulance people, okay? So there was a very close association with the police department, or I should say with police. I also have s multiple family members who are police uh, and fire. That boomer uh, had it coming to a mic. So my point is this. I always learned that if you are being arrested, if a cop tells you to put your hands behind your back, and I've been arrested before, um, when they tell you that, you do it. That's right. You do it. And that's what I say on the show, Mike. If you are out of shape, obese, have diabetes, uh, don't resist arrest at all times. I mean, just no. lay on the floor, lay face first on the floor right away. Don't resist because as soon as you get tased, you're going to have a heart attack, especially if you are overweight, obese, have diabetes, have high blood pressure. The comps will not hesitate uh, to whip your ass. Right. So yes. when I got when I got busted in, uh, I think it was 2000. I think it was 2006, maybe. Um, you know, they pulled me over. By the way, there was like 11 cop cars and narcs. They Ronnie, they Ronnie Kinged you, Mike. 
<laughs> no, not even close. Oh, okay. But I got pulled over, and all these police and narcotic. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I got I got busted for drugs, and oh uh, they God. pulled me over, and it was eleven cars. Eleven. Eleven cars. cars. 11 squad wow. cars on un, uh, unmarked cars and narc cars you know so i get out of the car you know i'm mm -hmm. like okay okay you got me you got me and um you know had my hands behind the back they were they were nice to me uh and mind you um the two police officers who had my back were i had a uh a, a a a black um, I want to say he was like a sergeant or a lieutenant or something. Right. And then the other guy was white. And mm -hmm. so everything was fine. I didn't get beat up or anything. But my point was this. I didn't resist arrest. I, I, I simply, even if I was, if, if I wasn't guilty, I, I would have, I would not have resisted because that's when you get Rodney King. That's right. And especially out here in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. In L.A., San Diego, the, these places, you don't, you do not want to resist arrest. I mean, we're not like the other um, the, the police departments out there, like in Buffalo. You're not going to see that sort of uh, nonsense going on. They'll, they'll beat the shit out of you out here. You know, the thing is, Michael, th th there's so many incidences where police have been killed because they, they keep their, they, they let their guard down. That too. So. You got police who are, you know, look, man, these people, I've had relatives, as I said, that are out on the beat and, and you know, they here. go into these places like Patterson, uh, Patterson, New Jersey, which is a freaking war zone. Um, that's a hard and, gig, no doubt. And that's right. why we have a police officer who will be on the show, a female police officer, a rookie. I mean, that's a tough gig. No doubt. Especially with all this going on, right? Wow. I mean, one of my friends is, is uh, uh, you know, one of the guys I went to school, I lived in my town with, uh, he, he's a police officer and he ha has actually shot and killed wow. two people who came at him. We need to bring that guy on too. I could ask him. He, he's not much of a talker, but I could ask him. We could, yeah, we could, um, uh, we could pull his, his arm. We could um, pull his leg. <laughs> we could do whatever. We could uh, entice him. Yeah, okay. he'd be a great guest, Mike. You want me to ask him? I'll ask him. Yeah, go ahead. I think it'd be great to talk to a few people in the line here, in the line of duty. Why not? Okay, I will. I will. Yeah, that'd be cool. Be a good time. So, Mike... You don't, uh, you don't want to resist, man. You don't want no. to resist, because that's when the trouble can start. Yes, you don't want to do that. And, of course, now I'm reading more reports here. The Buffalo police team resigns to support officers who push over that elderly man i guess a lot of officers um resign mike i, I, I don't know. i'm it's, speechless honestly Michael. I, I yeah, don't know it's what a, to say it's man. a very strange thing going on here in america and of course we are we, we definitely don't support any sort of um racism towards anyone no not at all and of course not we at all. we support everyone's take on religion as well even though we both um, I'm an atheist. Uh, Mike is, is a Satanist, and we we still respect everyone's views here. That's right. Yeah. And 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 for the record, you know, I just I'm sorry if this offends offends anybody, but I support the police. The the all right. Look, I know we're the year, enemies uh, now, Mike. Uh, since we're going to be bringing in cops and that, I mean, we already are uh, enemy number one to some folks out there. But Mike, you know, you can't so win. You can't win, no, though. You know, we're we're you're, you're right. Yeah, it's whatever. It happens. But you know, I I wanted to say like, I support the police, and and sure. last year, last year. Now here here here's something I want everybody to listen to very very carefully. I support both sides. La oh, yes, yes. And you also know that I support the fact that the guy, George Floyd, was wrongfully killed. I believe so. Second degree murder. Could have been easily and, avoided. And you know what's going to happen when he goes to court and second degree murder, which is not intent to kill. Right. When they, when they declare him not guilty, watch the riots begin. Oh, it's going to happen. So, so here's, let me make this very valid point, and everybody should listen very carefully to this. There is a talk about how the police are systematically trying to kill black people. Well, last year, nine black people were killed by white officers. Does that sound like a systematic uh, elimination of a, of a race to you? 
Michael? What was that? Does that sound like a systematic uh, uh, elimination of a race to you? Not exactly. Nine, nine people killed last year. Nine black people killed by white officers. Yeah, that's kind of a reaching to say that, that the police are looking to kill African Americans. I think that's, right. a, uh, that's, a, that's a fabrication there. How many people are killed every friggin' day in Chicago by black-on-black -black gang violence? I'm sure it happens all the time. I think there was one day when 50, I don't recall exactly what day this was, but I, I, a while back, if I'm not, if I'm not incorrect in my, in my memory here, I believe in one day, 50 black people were killed in black related crime and gang violence in one day in Chicago. You don't hear about that on the news, right? Not at all. Of course not. It doesn't fit the narrative. No, and that's well, the problem. But though. police are all bad. Police are all bad. The thing know, is, according to the thing I'm is, sorry. um, you know, most people won't believe anything until it's on the news. That's the sad part. Right, and and you know, sometimes you got to do some fact checking yourself. But you got to do a lot of fact checking because you can't trust the media. No, of course not. Especially what's been going on with, with the 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 hatred towards our president. The media is not a reliable pathway to truth, just like a faith is. Like I was saying in the beginning of the interview, faith is not a reliable path to truth. No. Sorry, but facts are facts, and facts I like to be. Are facts. And I like to be backed by the facts, baby. That's right, buddy. Amazing. So, Mike, go ahead and. Um, Help us sign off here. Go ahead and plug anything you like before we bring it home. And of course, Mike, we do have assignment tomorrow night with Mr. Max Egan. Right. Amazing. Go ahead, so, Mike. So um, I want to say uh, thank you, Michael. As always, a wonderful show. Um, I want to say thank you to the audience for listening. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested in any of my artwork or photography, you can you can check it out and um, uh, see it at Horrible artwork.com horribleartwork.com if you're interested in any of my music uh, musical efforts and releases you can go to mikehideous.com that's m-y-k-e hideous.com and also if you're interested in checking me out on Facebook which I really cannot stand and hardly ever go on <laughs> anymore uh, you, can, you can see me at uh, hide um, facebook.com slash hideous Mike, M Y K E. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Michael. And I will talk to you tomorrow night, my friend. Wherever I go, God rules. Amazing. <laughs> when I walk on White House grounds, God walks on White House grounds. I had every right and authority to declare the White House as holy ground because I was standing there, and where I stand is holy. <laughs> To say no to President Trump would be saying no to God, and there, Whoa. and I won't do that. We are in a spiritual war right now. I let every demonic network that has aligned itself against the purpose, against the calling of President Trump, let it be broken. Let it be torn down in the name of Jesus. You want me to tell you what my thoughts are? The thoughts of the King of Kings, the thoughts of the Lord of Lords. Oh I'm my. downloading heaven. Holy <laughs> shit. Oh my god. I hate when people talk to this fake. Oh this shit, here talking. we go. This is for the Biden. This is for the fans of Biden right here. I kinda know I'm a little bit cute, right? Oh yeah. I am Paula who is pretty. Well, maybe I'm not gonna be pretty when I'm 90 years old. Here's this former Probably mess. not. Oh my god, can you imagine this lady at 90 years old? No, I can't. Jesus <laughs> Christ, that Paula White. Uh, oh golly. You know what? What, what was she screaming about? You know what? Uh, what? Uh, elder men always told me, Mike. You know what that was, Mike? No, a fart. <laughs> no, elder men always told me that women age like milk. It's sour. That's right. That Mississippi girl <laughs> lived in a trailer that they called trailer trash. Trailer trash. Daddy committed suicide. Got pregnant out of wedlock. Been married. Been divorced. Not just once. You know, would you knock it out with uh, that Paula White there? Is that who that was? Yeah, it's same, Paula White. same person, same girl. Oh, Lord, can you She's imagine that? Wacko. Imagine that no, next I... to you there, Mike. 
No, no, I couldn't. Oh, Not man. for the rest of my life, I couldn't. Holy shit. Why? People go, well, how'd you become the spiritual advisor of the president? We'll get to that later. It's all in there. Michael Jackson, Kid Rock, the president, it's all in there, all right? Thank you, Paula. What a great job you do. The evangelicals. I hear we're more popular than ever with the evangelicals. You're the only one, and she'll tell the truth. She'll only tell the truth. Southern California is looking at... Ban- well, there's- I still don't think uh, uh, the president is a uh, religious guy. I don't think he ever was. I mean, the guy could take photographs all he wants next to a church, but come on. I, I come on. I, man. I don't think he was, and I don't think he is. I think um, I think I, I, I think some of his um, supporters out there are a little retarded. Not all of them, but just there's a small percentage of them <laughs> that I think are a little dumb. <laughs> I, I have to agree with you. I like as much don't. As I, I, I don't want to insult his, his listeners or his, his hardcore fan base because, you know, I do like Trump myself, but I think yeah, some of them are too. a little fucking dumb. <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a, just a tad. <laughs> They're a little fucking autistic. Let's just put it that way. Oh, Lord. I'll get shit for that, but I don't care. <laughs> Cry more, bitch. I don't give a fuck. Authority law is passed through the governor that says the Bible is a book of hate speech and to ban the sale of it. Snapchat was what? created as the largest human trafficking because the greatest people on there were human traffickers because the FBI and because intelligence could not do it because it's live and it's real time and they can track your kid in less than a second and take them. There's a Department of Treasury in heaven that God is watching over everything you do and you are storing up eternal treasure. Treasure that will go He's watching you, an invisible man in the sky, making sure you're not doing anything bad. Somebody's watching me. That's right. <laughs> Incredible. You know, I gotta ask you that. I gotta ask you real quick. What was she screaming about? I, you know, I wish I knew, but that lady, oh, okay. <laughs> she just goes into these rants, Mike. I have no idea what that woman is saying. Oh my gosh. Good lord, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> the crazy soccer mom with a Xanax problem that you see standing in front of you at a Starbucks. Oh. My God. Goodness gracious. That's what I want in life, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I really want that. Yeah, yeah, give it to me. Give Jesus. To me. Mike, once again, thank you so much for being a part of the program. It's been fun. You got it, buddy. I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? You got it, man. Take care. Good night, everyone. Mahalo. And there he goes, boys and girls, the one and only Mr. Mike Hideous. I want to thank all of you out there before we pull this Larry Silverstein style. That's right. Once again, thank you so much for being a part of the program. That was a fun evening, no doubt. Thank you to Mr. Mike Hideous and Captain Dan Handley, all the mods in the chat room. I appreciate that. And of course, those who donated... If you did, I really do appreciate that as well. Don't forget, if you are a listener of the program and want to help fund the program, uh, oh yeah, thank you to Max, Max Cole. He did donate. Thank you to Max. Again, don't forget, if you are a listener or a hardcore fan, please direct yourself to patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon. And yes, exclusive content only for you that won't be found anywhere else. Oh, yes. Of course, if you don't want to join Patreon, you can just go to michaeldeacon.com and right-hand side of your screen there is a PayPal button. Go there. Any amount helps. And of course, if you do, I will personally send you some uh, Patreon episodes that you might have missed. And that's a good reminder. I need to do that tonight there's a few of you out there that i need to deliver this digital crack to no doubt please subscribe to the youtube channel if you haven't already and of course download the podcast rendition of the program on itunes stitcher cast box and spotify international listeners out there thank you so much for your support as well canada germany uk australia norway and brazil Love all of you very much as well. Now, whatever it is that you do choose to believe, you must adapt now to all the changes around you, boys and girls. That is what life is all about. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place, and life itself is a mystery. 
Until next time. Good night, everybody.